Hey, we're so glad you decided to join us on YouTube. You're about to hear a message from our teaching team. We hope this message helps equip you for freedom and to find purpose in your everyday life. We stream our online services every Sunday. You can visit us at freedomhouse.cc slash live to connect with us and become part of our online campus. We know that you're gonna enjoy this message you're about to watch. Well, hey, my name is Penny Maxwell. My husband and I are the senior pastors here at Freedom House. And uh, the way that we do things here at Freedom House, if you aren't aware, is we have a teaching team that teaches at all of our campuses all across the city. Uh, and I get to be here with you guys today. And as a matter of fact, here's the cool thing. There are people actually all over the world, all over the country that are tuning in. We have Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Indiana, New York, Massachusetts, Tennessee, Washington. Praise Jesus. There are Christians in Washington. Yes. Michigan and Colorado. So we have at our uh, Lake Norman campus today. One of our teaching team members, his name is Michael Holt. If you are a big YouTuber, you're on YouTube, you will know his name on YouTube is Molt. He has millions of followers, the most humble, incredible guy. Uh, he attends our South End campus, but he's speaking at our Lake Norman campus today. And then my son, Colby, and the youth teams, they are speaking at our South End location because they are doing a youth, a student takeover. So all of our teenagers and our young people are all down at South End today taking over that campus. And Pastor Troy is actually at our sister church in Atlanta today, and he is speaking there. And I was getting pictures early this morning. Montel Jordan is the, the uh, worship pastor there. So Montel and Troy, they were all sending me pictures. And uh, they're having a good time there in Atlanta. But let me just tell you, we're having a good time up here at Freedom House today. We're having some fun. We're having some fun. Well, we've been in a series this summer on miracles. How many of you know that the path to your miracle will usually come through unexpected territory? And oftentimes that territory can be a bit rocky. There's highs and lows. When we're in the midst of waiting for our miracle to happen, sometimes we can get a bit discouraged. We can get a bit down. And we can even start to do things like have a conversation with God because you know, we understand there are needs that we need met, and we do the best we can to try to fill those needs. And when it doesn't happen, we're like, hey, God, what's going on? And you see, that's just the problem is we try to fill those needs. And God is saying, hey, why don't you let me do that? But we oftentimes try to help him out a little bit. They're like, you know, God, just so you know, I would have done it this way. I think this sounds way more logical uh, hey, God, I think it should have happened already, actually. Uh, yesterday would have been a really good time for you to bring this to pass in my life. And we're, we get pretty good at giving God advice. You know what I'm saying? How many of you in the room really appreciate being manipulated? Raise your hand if you love being manipulated. You know what I found is that God doesn't really like it either. But oftentimes when we need something from him, that's exactly what we try to do. I don't think it's intentional, but we decide we're going to tell God how we think things should happen. In essence, what we do is we are being manipulative. I was reading this scripture this week, and uh, it's uh, Jeremiah 32, 27, and it says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? And I read that, and I kept going, and the Lord said, go back and read it again. I was like, okay. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? Well, I went to the next verse. He said, go back and read it again. I'm like, seriously? We read it twice. Like, I, I know how to read. All right? I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? He said, go back and read it again. And I'm like, Okay. There's obviously something that he's needing me to see, needing me to understand that I'm failing to understand or see. So I went back and I read it for the fourth time. And I read it a little slower and I pondered it. And I said, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? And then I started thinking, you are the Lord. 
You are God of all mankind. Is there anything that's too hard for you? You see, what happens if we're not careful? We can read a scripture like that, and it can just become words on a paper instead of words to live by. Because truthfully, if we believed that those were more than just words on a paper, we wouldn't walk around with anxiety. We wouldn't walk around with fear. We wouldn't walk around with depression. We wouldn't walk around with insecurity. If we truly read those words and said, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind, is there anything too hard for me? And it wasn't just something that was words on a page, which is cranial up here, but it dropped 12 inches to right here. You see, that drop is a real important drop because it means, God, I'm not just reading this about you. I believe this is who you are. This is who you are. And then I read Luke 18, 27. It said, but Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. In other words, God, when I don't understand, when I don't know how this situation is going to turn around, when I don't know how my marriage is going to get fixed, when I don't know how my bills are going to get paid, when I don't know how this sickness in my body that is incurable is going to be healed, when I don't know, God, what is not possible with man is possible with you. It keeps us out of our brain and lets our spirit connect with God and it bypasses the gray matter and brings us a supernatural peace where we don't wake up every day in anxiety. We don't wake up every day wondering what shoe, what, you know, is the other shoe going to drop today? I remember as a kid, a lot of the things that I went through, the abuse and the sexual abuse, I remember waking up each day not knowing what was going to happen. And the Bible talks about it. It's called an evil foreboding. Because you're unsure of what's going to happen because you've been through some trauma. Now, when I was a little girl, I didn't know how to get out of that. But now that I'm almost 48 years old, let me just tell you, whatever is impossible with man is possible with God. I know that to be true. You know, uh, I'm about to tell you something miraculous that happened just a few months ago. It's the craziest story ever and um, ridiculous, but I want to start off and just give you a little background on the story. For those of you who may not know, my two oldest children are getting married this year, one in September and one in November. Well, fast or rewind a bit, last year, um, this young man who had become friends with my daughter, my second child, he'd become friends with her, and he started taking a liking to my daughter, my daughter started taking a liking to him, and started kind of hanging around a little bit, really nice guy, well, he wanted uh, to date our daughter, so he is a very, very southern gentleman, sweet, kind, and he understands that in our house, character is a big thing. He understands that there's a way you're going to do things and a way we're going to live our life as a family. And so he very much wanted to be respectful and wanted to be honoring. He understood honor. And he came to my husband and he said, Pastor Troy... I would like to date Cabell. And my husband said, okay, I've got a few questions for you. The most important question I have for you first is do you tithe? He said, sir. He said, it's an easy question. Do you tithe? That's either a yes or a no. Do you tithe, Noah? And he just kind of blinked a bit and he said, um, can you explain that to me? And he goes, let me explain it to you like this, Noah. He said, the Bible says that if you don't tithe, tithing means you give the first 10% of your income back to God. It never was yours in the first place. The Bible says you're returning what was already his. That's his. He marked it as his. And it's a trust test to see 
where your trust is in the Lord. If you're not tithing, you're not trusting God. And he said, as a matter of fact, in Malachi, it says, not only are you not trusting God, but you're robbing from God. And he said, the reason I want to know is if you're tithing is because if you're robbing from God, you will try to rob from me. And he said, my daughter is something you will not, you will not be robbing. And he said, do you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> and Noah said, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I understand. And he said, so let me ask you the question again. Do you tithe? He said, no, sir, I do not tithe. But, but sir, I'm going to start tithing. <laughs> And he said, good, see to it that you do. As long as you do, you have my permission to date my daughter. So fast forward, Noah began tithing, right? And uh, things just, crazy things just started happening in Noah's life. And the, it's a much longer story, and, but I'm going to make it shorter for you. So what ends up happening is Noah ends up getting violently, violently ill. He gets extremely sick. And as a matter of fact, he gets so sick that he's in and out of the hospital multiple times. He was in the Bahamas on a cruise, and he went with a bunch of his college buddies, and he got so sick, he got um, a rare disease from being in a foreign country. As a matter of fact, the CDC, when they found out they had it, the CDC was there. Everybody was all excited in a creepy, weird sort of way because nobody had ever seen this in Charlotte before. So he ended up getting this crazy thing called chikungunya. Then he got uh, what's called an astrovirus. Then on top of it, he got C. diff, which is deadly on its own. And then he went septic. So he is in the hospital, dangling by a thread to his life, right? All this stuff's happening. For three months, he's out of work. We actually had to move him into our house and take care of him because he couldn't even lift a spoon up to eat. Like, literally could not physically lift a spoon up, right? So we took care of him, nursed him back to health, and said, now that you're healthy, you can't be in our house anymore living. It's one thing if you're a sick young man, but if you're a healthy young man, you need to be staying somewhere else, if you know what I'm saying. So we got him back to health. He moved back out and still was dealing with um, some issues in his body and just recovering from all that had happened, and literally three months didn't work. So he comes to me. He has a conversation with me, and he's, he's sitting in our living room, and he's like, hey, I really want to ask Cabell to marry me. He'd already gotten permission from Pastor Troy. He said, and I want to get this ring, um, but I know I'm going to have to get it pretty quickly in order to have it made because I've, I've called around and it's going to take about a month, a month and a half to have it made. And um, he said, I'm trying to find it online so if I can find it a little cheaper. He said, it's actually going to wipe out everything that I have because I haven't been working for three months, but he still had to pay all of his bills that were coming in and medical bills now on top of it. And he was like, literally, it's going to wipe me out. And so he says, I need to get my finances in order and just kind of figure out what I have since I've been sick. And he sits there and he's like, well, first thing i got to do is tithe. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> so he does that first and then he figures out what he has left. And he says, you know, I'm going to try to do something online. I said to him, Noah, why don't you go to Diamonds Direct? It's right across from South Park Mall. Why don't you go there and see if they can help you? He's like, do you think they can? And I said, well, I know they don't carry raw diamonds because Cabell was very specific. She's the artsy millennial, right? She didn't want a normal diamond. She had to have a raw one that's fresh out of the ground, that's never been cut, never been disturbed, just a raw natural diamond in a setting, right? That's my daughter. And so... I said, I know they don't carry them, but they might could get one in for you and you could have it in time. So he goes down to Diamonds Direct. To make a long story short, he was waiting and, you know, it was a very busy day. The person who was supposed to help him um, ended up having to, you know, take a few minutes longer. So the owner of Diamonds Direct comes in and says, come, come on back here. Come in my office. And he's like, tell me what you're looking for. No begins to describe to him this raw diamond and he's like, that is so crazy that you say that. He said, because nobody else in this entire store even has a clue. But guess what? 
We got some in. The De Beers Diamond Company sent me some because this is the next new wave that millennials are wanting. And I was like, yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> yes. It's the next new craze. So he's like, let me get uh, them. They're in the vault. I will come and I will open them up and I will show you. And you can look at them and just pick one that you like. You know, there was 30 of them. He said, pick one that you like and let's talk about price. And Noah was like, well... You probably ought to tell me which ones are in what price zone first. And he told him about how he'd been out of work. And he was like, you know, my budget is, you know, this amount. And the guy says, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's just figure this through. Brings out the diamonds. Of course, Noah picked the biggest one, 3.2 carats, right? <laughs> He's like, I really like this one. And the guy says, you know what, that would probably look cool in this setting like this. And Noah's like, well, how long would it take? And he goes, you know what, I'm so excited about this because this is such a new thing. Let me go get one of my jewelers now. Goes and gets a jeweler, puts the setting on it, and makes it all right there on the spot, right? And then Noah's starting to panic and get a little bit nervous because he didn't know he's going to quite take it that far. And he's just thinking, he still hadn't told me how much this thing is going to cost. And I'm quite quite panicked. And he's already thinking, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wipe me out. So the owner comes back, says, what do you think about this? And he said, it's incredibly beautiful. It's everything she's wanted. And he's like, uh, but we just kind of need to talk price. And he goes, you're right, we do. I'll be back in just a second. And he goes and he brings a box. He puts it in a box and he wraps it up. And he said, we just want to bless you. This just happened, y'all. I, I have a picture of Cabell and Noah that I wanted to show you because they're at Lake Norman campus. That's the two of them. So they're at Lake Norman campus. They're engaged, getting married in November. And I think I have another picture of them, too. That's, that's her ring, raw diamond. That's when they just got engaged. She told me not to show that picture because she doesn't have makeup on. I said, it's your fault for not wearing makeup when you're getting engaged, OK? <laughs> All right. So then the last picture I want to show you is crazy. Show the last picture. I want you to see something here. Because when they got engaged, we were all actually on vacation. And this didn't dawn on me until we were all in the same place on vacation. We all took our rings. So on the left is my ring. In the middle is Cabell's raw diamond. And on the right is my son who just got engaged to his fiance. That's her ring. When we took off all of our rings and we were going out and we were going to play in the water and we put them in the safe, it was like the Lord said something to me and I didn't remember just how faithful he had been. My ring, which is on the left, 17 years ago was given to me by a man in the church when we were in Richmond, Virginia. We were youth pastors and he said, I have seen all you have done for the Lord for all these years. God told me to do this. God told me to bless you. And I cried my eyes out because we were getting ready to start Freedom House. And when we moved down here, right when we moved here, the very day, my husband lost my wedding ring. And so I didn't have one. Well, he said, guess what? I'm going to make you one. And you have to understand that I got engaged when I was 19 years old. I can promise you it didn't look anything like that. <laughs> So when he made that, it was so overwhelming that I literally cried for weeks and couldn't believe that God would do something like that. Skip to the middle. My son-in-law knew my story. When you've watched God be faithful, why would it be so hard to believe that maybe he could do the same thing in another year for you? Skip to the very uh, ring on the right. That diamond was my Mimi's diamond, and all the diamonds on the side were my daughter-in-law's diamonds from her mother's ring. We all started thinking, man, none of these rings did we pay for. <laughs> and I started going, we must have the diamond anointing. I will take that. I will take that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, here's the thing, is that miracles always come from unexpected sources always. Miracles always come from unexpected sources. There is no way that Noah woke up that day and said, I'm going to go to Diamonds Direct and the owner is just going to give me a 3.2 carat diamond ring. 
There is no way that crossed his mind. But you know what? How many times do we figure out how God's going to do it? If Noah would have tried to do it on his own, Noah would have had a wiped out bank account. Maybe, just maybe, we could start to believe and trust God and understand that God is God and I am not. Matter of fact, let's all say that. Say, God is God, God, is God. and I am not. I am Look at the person beside you. Say, God is God, God, is God. and I am, not. I am not. Do you know how freeing that is? It is so freeing. God, I don't have to figure all this out. I don't have to try to come up with an answer. If you'll do crazy stuff like that, God, maybe, just maybe, you can come through for me. You know, Elijah the prophet found himself in a situation where he was traveling down a path. He didn't quite understand everything. I want to kind of set up the story a little bit before I read it um, because I'm going to read to you uh, from 1 Kings. But here, here is Elijah. He is a prophet, right? Elisha goes to the king and he corrects the king. He corrects Ahab. He said, Ahab, you have gone outside of Israel looking for a wife and you know God is not pleased by that. You cannot ask God to bless anything that he has not ordained. You know, I think sometimes we do that. We ask God for things. God, can you bless my finances? But you're not tithing. God will never bless an idol. God, can you bless this relationship? I know we're having sex and we're not married, and I, you know, but God, will you bless it? God can never bless an idol. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church today. <laughs> we have to understand if we want God's blessings in our life, we have to be willing to be obedient to him. And Ahab wants a blessing on the kingdom, but he's gone outside of Israel to marry, and he marries Jezebel, who brings her wickedness and her gods back into Israel. And Elijah says, man, this, this isn't right. This is not a good thing. And Jezebel doesn't like the, the fact that he's come at her a bit. So she starts saying, I think we need to kill him. So, of course, doing the right thing, he runs off, right? He runs. And for three and a half years, he declares to them, because you have done this, it's not going to rain. The rain is going to stop, and there's going to be a famine, and there's going to be a drought. You see, here's the thing I want you to hear. There is a difference between an attack from the devil and when you're living in a famine, I would encourage you, an attack from the devil is normal. It means you're on the right road. But if you're in famine, look for sin. Every time you see a famine in the Bible, there's always sin at the root of it. Every single time. So here, we see that Elijah's like, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. The very next thing we see is he is sitting down by a dried up brook and God says to him, I want you to get up and I want you to go to Zarephath. There's a widow there. Now, I'm going to dig into that passage a little more, but I want to show you sequentially of some things that happen and I'm going to come right back to that. Elijah, after he leaves Zarephath and the widow sequentially, goes back because he knows the king and queen are trying to kill him. And he says, I tell you what, he sends another guy, tell the king, for all of his false prophets, all of their false gods to show up at this place at this time. And I'll show you that the God of Israel is the true God. He builds this big altar of stone, cuts up a bull, places it all over the altar. And in a drought, no less, takes 12 buckets, 12 huge buckets of water, dumps it on top of the bull pieces. And then he says, and I want you to watch this. He said, because God is literally going to take fire from heaven, come down, consume the water, the bull, and lick it all up. Like the water will literally be licked up. So that happens, and then he literally destroys the 850 false prophets, and it begins to rain again. After that event, the king is just hopping. He's like, Jezebel is going to be so mad when she hears about this. He gets in his chariot. The Bible says he had the fastest chariot ever. 
and he goes back to tell the queen. It says Elijah outruns the king's fastest chariot. It was 15 miles from where they were back to the palace. Now, I am not a scholar nor a mathematician, but somebody else was that did the math. He ran 25 miles an hour for 15 miles. Now, just to give you a little bit of perspective, Usain Bolt, he is clocked as the fastest runner on the planet. Usain Bolt from Jamaica. When I did the research, he did 60 meters and 80 meters, and the fastest time he's ever clocked is 27.8 miles per hour for just hundreds of feet. Here is Elijah running 25 miles an hour for 15 miles. Do you guys understand how crazy that is? So then after that happens, the queen says, because of what you have done, and slaughtering all these prophets, within the next 24 hours, I will have your head. Guarantee it. I will have your head. So he is quite afraid this time because he knows she is like on the warpath. You know what I mean? An angry woman. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> He's afraid. So he runs. He goes and he sits under a broom tree and he's in total depression. Complete depression. Interesting. Interesting. But here's what I want to do. I want to take you back to the beginning now that we've gone through the progression. I want to take you back to the beginning because I want you to understand that your miracle will always come from unexpected sources. Say that. Say, my miracle, my miracle will, always come will always come from unexpected, from unexpected sources. sources. So right in the beginning of all this crazy stuff going on, Elijah is sitting by this brook, and he'd been sitting by this brook for quite some time, hiding out, and in the morning, ravens would come in and bring meat and bread to him, and then they'd come in again in the evenings and bring meat and bread. That's a pretty crazy miracle, right? I'd rather have a diamond than meat and bread sometimes, but anyway, it's a great miracle, right? Sustenance. That happened for a while, and the brook that he was sitting by Actually, the Bible says because of the drought, it began to dry up. So God said to him, Elijah, you're going to need to get up from this brook. I want some place. I want you to go someplace. It's a place called Zarephath. And you see, there's a widow there who's going to take care of you. Now, I don't know about you, but I would be asking a few questions if I was God. You know, hey, God, um, where is Zarephath? Why a widow? Who is this woman? What am I supposed to do when I get there? Uh, when is this? Give me time frame. When is this going to take place? How long you want me to be there? Uh, God, since you're God and all and you bring ravens in with meat and bread every day, why don't you just let me stay here and just undry the brook? I mean, that seems a lot simpler. Don't you agree? I mean, you're the one that's holding the water back. From rain, just, just undry my little portion of the brook, and we'll all be happy, we'll all be good, right? First Kings 17, 8, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. You know what questions mean? Questions mean I'm trying to understand something. And what's interesting is we always try to understand and figure God out. What is there to try to understand about God? I mean, I understand why I would question a friend or ask, but when I start questioning God, it means because I'm trying to understand something. And my understanding is never going to equal God's. It's just not. So I would have a lot of questions because, you know, I think maybe I am like a few of you that control can be our comfort zone. Anybody in the house like that? So then the Lord says, you know, I want you to go to Zarephath. There's a widow there that's going to provide for you. Okay, that doesn't make sense at all. Everybody say, miracles always come, miracles always come. From, unexpected from unexpected sources. So there's three things I want to key in on this verse in 1 Kings 17, 8. There's three words, Zarephath, dwell, and widow. When it says go to Zarephath, 
I, I started just, one of the things I love to do is I love to go and I love to research. I love to figure out what does that word Zarephath means. I love to pull my Hebrew out. I love to pull my Greek out. I love to do all of these things. So what does that mean, Zarephath? Zarephath literally means a place of refining, a place of improvement, a place of polishing, a place of purifying, a place of removing impurities or unwanted elements. In other words, I'm going to need you to go to Zarephath because you're going to need refining. You're going to need polishing. You're going to need improvement because, see, I've got something for you down the road. I've got 850 prophets you're going to slay. I've got a chariot you're going to outrun. All these things are going to happen. You don't know it yet, but in order for you to get where I need you to be, you're going to have to be refined. And so you're going to have to go to this place of refining in order for you to be able to do and accomplish what I would like for you to do and accomplish. And as a matter of fact, you're not just going to go to Zarephath. You're going to dwell there. What does that mean to dwell there? You're not just passing through. You're going to have to live in a place of refinement, live in a place of polishing. In other words, this word means this isn't just going to be your lifestyle. You're, you're passing through. This will be your lifestyle. You're going to have to stay here, take up permanent residence, reside. That's what that word dwell means. You're going to have to go through revi- refining in order for you to be where you need to be. And it's not just something you're going to walk through. You're going to have to learn to stay in that place of refining. Stay there. Okay, but, but let's talk about the widow thing because, you know, that's illogical. That makes no sense to me. A widow? Really? Let me just give you some facts about widows. A widow will provide is what God had said to him. Widows were taken care of by public charity. They gleaned in the fields and the orchards and the vineyards. See, when the farmer would come in and he would take care of his field, what would happen is there would be some fragments that would be left to the side. The widows were allowed to come in. That was their welfare system. We know that, in general, widows were classed with orphans and fatherless. There were laws that governed their care, their food, their shelter. They were often overlooked and poor and alone and abandoned. Can somebody say, miracles always come from unexpected sources? God, you mean this destitute woman is going to take care of me? She can't even take care of herself, let alone in a famine. That is completely illogical. It makes no sense at all. Now let me give you some facts about this specific widow, and then we're going to bring this in for a landing. This specific widow. The scriptures say that God's people are the ones that are to care for the widows. And this specific widow, her husband had died. She had no food. She had no money. She was poor. There was no savings whatsoever that she had. She was in total fear. She was suicidal. She had this one little cake left. She was going to eat this one little cake, and then her and her son were going to die. She was in a state of depression. You want her to take care of me? Mm, Not so sure about that, God. But miracles always come from unexpected sources. You see, what ended up happening in this situation with Elijah is Elijah came and that little cake multiplied. It multiplied at the hands of Elijah. You see, sometimes what we don't understand is that God will perform a miracle in your life, but it's not just for you. God could have undried that brook, and it would have taken care of Elijah. But when God said, pick up and go to Zarephath, there's a widow who's going to take care of you, and in her taking care of you, you're going to get your needs met, and it's going to give her money, savings, a future. Oh, and on top of that, Elijah, her son is going to die, and you're going to raise her son from the dead. Can you stand on your feet today? Two chapters later, we find Elijah, he's depressed, and he's sitting under the broom tree. After he defeated all the prophets of Baal, after he outran the chariot, all these things are happening. All these miracles are going on. How in the world does he find himself in a state of depression? You see, sometimes what can happen 
is we forget where we're supposed to dwell. You see, dwelling in a place of refinement, it's not just about where we are physically. It's about where we are internally. Where are we dwelling internally? Where are we at? Here's the thing I know is that where God guides, God provides. If God says go to Zarephath, you better pack up now. You better leave now. God's promises always hinge on our obedience. Always. And sometimes what I found is the miracle is not just about that my situation would change, but maybe it's about my attitude changing. Maybe it's about my attitude. And what I've also found is God is all you need. Doesn't matter what the brook looks like. Doesn't matter who's after you, who's chasing you down, who's angry with you, who's against you. Doesn't matter what your checkbook looks like. God is all you need. You never have to argue with your fear, ever. You just tell your fear to go talk to your Jesus. I have two chairs. Are they nearby where somebody could bring those chairs up? The song that we sang earlier, I actually went online and was looking it up because I love it so much. And um, I found out a little history about it. It's the song Miracles by Jesus Culture. And I was actually talking with Molly last night because if you couldn't tell, Molly was part of Jesus Culture. If you were wondering, man, girl's got the goods. She does. And um, I was talking with her last night. The guy who wrote the song had actually just lost his baby boy. He passed away. And he wrote this song about miracles. Right in the midst of burying your boy. But what he wanted to really cement in his heart is, God, I believe you're the God of miracles. No matter what's going on in my world, it's not about believing in something, but about believing in someone. And when they performed that song live, the pastor came out and he said, you know what, sometimes you have to do. And I, it was such a picture for me. I said, man, that's it. He said, sometimes when you're going through a really hard place, he said, I'll pull two chairs out. He said, I'll sit in one. And I'm thinking he's going to say that the other one is for Jesus. Just to remember that Jesus is always with you. That's not what he said. He said, I pretend like I'm telling the devil to sit down. He said, you sit down and you watch me praise. You sit down, you watch me lift my hands up. You sit down, you watch me sing. You sit down. No matter what happens to me, I will lift my voice. I will lift my hands. Can you guys do that with me? Just lift your voice. Lift your hands. Just sing it out, Molly. Come on, say it. I believe in you. I believe in you.
I want us to all understand this. It's so important in the culture that we live in that we learn to look with our spiritual eyes and not our natural eyes. Our natural eyes can deceive us. Our natural eyes can take us down the wrong path. Get your worship music out. Get your Bible out. Turn, the Bible says, turn your head to where your help comes from. When there are things that try to attach themselves to me, I will not allow them to take residence in my life. I may feel the sting of pain, but I will not live there. And I know you are the same way. All summer long, we're going to continue talking about miracles. And if you are needing a miracle in your life, outside in the lobby, we have pins. We have a big prayer box there. Write your miracle on there. Circle your miracle because we are believing it's going to be completed. We're circling that miracle in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and join us for online services. If you'd like to learn more about Freedom House or how you can become part of our church, visit our website at freedomhouse.cc.